If you recall the last occasion I had to minister in chapel, we talked about the form of the servant and addressed a, a, an issue which I feel is still around, uh, certainly didn't eliminate it by uh, speaking about it, but the issue of the absence of a good, wholesome work ethic in our world and how even among the realms of Christians we have a, a tendency or can have easily a tendency to be less than dedicated to the wholesomeness of a, of a work ethic. And so we talked about the form of the servant, Jesus works. Uh, he did indeed, and that testimony is repeatedly given of his earthly ministry. Uh, I then put together just a little creed at the end of that that I, I don't know if you're still making use of it. I have it inside of a little book that I keep with me regularly to help my appointments and information. But uh, we talked about the Worker's Creed. Uh, I'm going to ask you to just read it with me. Would you do it, please? In all that I plan, do the best that I can for God, not man. Taken from that passage in Colossians where we ought to find ourselves absolutely motivated to do our very best, not in the sense of grades or recognition, but out of recognition, we're going to answer to God. God's going to hold us accountable whether we are exercising the most effective uh, testimony of work as we go about the task, whether it's a mundane task like a job you might have in the mall or here on campus, or whether it's the work you do for a class, whether it's the testimony of your life. In any way, we ought to have a testimony of excellence God demands excellence, and we have a world of mediocrity and content with just participating and even to the point of giving recognition just because you're on the team type stuff. No, God wants us to excel, not for the sake of personal recognition, but He's a God of excellence, and He requires of us that kind of same standard. And so in the form of the servant, Jesus works. I want to move to another crisis of sorts that I believe is in our world today, in this illustration of the form of the servant. And I don't think I have to convince you of this. Maybe we have different illustrations that we might all use to describe it. But I believe we have a crisis of leadership. A crisis of leadership. We see it in the sense of our world around us, the desperation for wholesome, godly leadership, or just even wholesome, wise leadership in the arena of our world, whether it's government or whether it's in the realm of of different activities. We've got all kinds of complications with leadership in sports. And, and I, I mean with all my heart, leadership is a crisis. And then in the realm of just ministry, apart from the vacuum, as I mentioned a moment ago, of pastoral leadership, we have such deficient perceptions of leadership. And it's a burden of my heart that we come to recognize what Jesus said about leadership and how we should exercise our agreement, our compliance. And so, if you will, Jesus leads. Jesus leads. Now, that's a particular description about Jesus that's not frequently given. I don't know how many times I think everybody would say, was Jesus a leader? And they'll say yes. But when it comes to really capturing and studying how his leadership unfolded and how it was exercised and how he demonstrated in his earthly ministry, quite frankly, there's very minimal literature dealing with it. And I don't mind saying it's a, a topic that I find myself saying that's not described as studies that describe his philosophy or his his particular style of leadership. As a reminder, I think this is just as pre, uh, a much a prerequisite for us as you know, Jesus working. Uh, take note of this familiar passage you find in Colossians again also, where we had this illustration that we're supposed to find ourselves with this illustration of the scale, that we're supposed to walk worthy. And the word worthy there is a, a term for scale or a term for a business description in the marketplace of Jesus' day or the New Testament time in which you see the illustration on the screen, this kind of a scale that was balanced and you'd put one kind of a weight on this side and then match it with a product that was being purchased on this side. And so that whole concept of walking worthy is saying, I want to walk with the equivalence of Jesus' walk. And so Jesus on one side of the scale... And I should find my life equaling that on the other side of the scale so that the balancing of my life is equivalent. Walking worthy with a sense of equivalence to what Jesus does as He walks or as He leads. And so when we talk about Jesus' leadership, may I just say this is not something that is just a, an alternate option that we could follow. This is, by all standard, the only biblical leadership model you can find. And in today's world, we've got all kinds of misconceptions. In fact, most leadership topics these days revolve around personalities. And so we'll have some person that I call a notable quotable, 
who is particularly famous for something that might be measurably accomplished. You know, they might have a large church or they might have a large media ministry or a large record of writings and those kinds of things. And those don't necessarily indicate a person's a poor person or is not a godly leader. But may I just tell you, in our world of seeking notoriety and in our world of following personalities, we more than ever as God's children need to stop and say, what is God's standard of leadership? Even most writings that deal with leadership focus on that person's accomplishments. And we try to replicate that person instead of recognizing that the evidence of a true leader is not them, it's the result of their lives and their work. And so with a, a, a backdrop of that sort, I will just say without any apology, I, I've been determined in my own heart by God's grace to know how Jesus taught us to lead. How did Jesus teach us to lead? And uh, may I just say, you might say, well, I'm not a leader. I'm not going to be a leader. I don't want to be a leader. Here's my honest statement to every person present this morning. Every person is a leader in some place. Every person. If nothing else, leading your life personally is an assignment you have. How I lead myself is a part of leadership. And so every person, regardless of your status, regardless of your gender, every person is obligated to say, how did Jesus teach us to lead. I don't say this with promotional purposes, but just as a reference, uh, God gave me the privilege at invitation to write Biblical Slave Leadership a few years back, and I'm in the process of a sequel to that, which is amplifying particularly Jesus' modeling of His own teaching in His earthly ministry. And so we'll be, Lord willing, having in, in the foreseeable future a, a reference that follows this called you know, the model Biblical Slave Leader, mentored by the Master, my purpose in referencing that is, well, I guess a little bit of a commercial. If you want to, as seniors, I think, and juniors, uh, and others that you have by way of friends, this is one of the courses in the master's program that I get the chance to teach. We'll be teaching it during spring break this year. Uh, it's still opportunity to, to get involved, is it not, Dean Rowe? If they wish to consider that as an opportunity, the, the model biblical slave leader is certainly going to be part of that. But we just talked about this whole topic of biblical slave leadership. But this morning, I'd like to just ask you, if you would, please, to uh, make some observations about Jesus' leadership teaching. If you will, I have four observations of leadership lesson by Jesus that I want you to capture with me. And I'll invite you to turn to Mark chapter 10, if you would, please. Uh, there are only two, two references in the New Testament where Jesus directly teaches about leadership. They're the same episode. It's in Matthew chapter 20 and Mark chapter 10, where Jesus at one point teaches very explicitly what a leader's supposed to be. And I invite you to just capture these truths as a part of your own intent to lead yourself, to lead a family, to lead a ministry, wherever God takes you to have a role of responsibility. And uh, so as we move through this task of being like the servant, matching the balancing scale, how did Jesus lead? That's how I should lead. And with that backdrop, Mark chapter 10, I'd invite you, please, we're going to begin our reading in verse 35 and read through verse 45. Stand with me, please, out of honor to God's Word, but also out of honor to that model leader, the Lord Jesus, as He is involved with guiding us in this portion of Scripture. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto Him, saying, Master, we would that ye shouldest do for us whatever we shall desire. And He said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They say unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what you ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. When the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they who are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But... So shall it not be among you, but whosoever would be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you would be chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, 
and to give his life a ransom for many. Have a seat, please, and I invite you to join me now as we look at this portion of Scripture with this very clear intent to understand what Jesus taught and believed, his philosophy of leadership. And I again say to every one of you, all of us are involved in some capacity of leadership. We must follow his teaching if we're going to be the form of the servant. Note observation number one, if you would, please, as we look at it together. And that's the setting for leadership that we see. This setting for leadership given in verses 35 and 37. If you look at Matthew's record, we have a, a little bit of a trivia detail difference in the sense that they're, the mother of James and John was involved with this conversation. Mark doesn't choose to, to include that for some reason. So I have to honestly believe, I don't think it was just mama trying to do something for the boys. I think they were just as involved. And so with a sense of awareness here, we find this beginning of setting, first of all, with what I call a self-centered ambition. A self-centered ambition. As you take note of this, I want you to just understand that it's pretty obvious that this was a pretty self-centered request. I see it particularly with this thought. Do for us. And I just say at the very outset, when a person wants to be a leader and it's do for me, they are disqualified. No leader has that as their ambition. And furthermore, it's do for us what we want, what we desire. This is not something that was particularly spiritually motivated, wasn't prayerfully thought through, wasn't saying, I want to serve Jesus more faithfully, here's how I could do that. This is a very self-centered ambition. And I just tell you, that's not how leadership works, biblically. But note further, it's a an interesting response that Jesus makes. I call it a selfless answer. A selfless answer in verse 36. I just try to put myself into this setting and say, here's Jesus, who knew all things, so these you know, comments from them were not necessarily at all foreign to his awareness, but in his humanity, he's there. These two disciples of his come and very you know, boldly and just unashamedly say, we need something from you, what we want. To me, it would have been an opportunity for Jesus to say, now I want to just teach you guys something. I know better for you than you do. But he doesn't. With all graciousness and a sense of, I think, just genuine testimony of his own leadership eligibility, he says, uh, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And may I just say, we immediately sense the difference in the climate and the atmosphere and the chemistry of these two settings. This very self-centered one over here, James and John, and this very, very responsive, tender spirit of a true leader, Jesus Christ. Capture the contrast in this very moment. But we see a third then thought in this setting. It's what I call a self-seeking aspiration in verse 37. A self-seeking aspiration. They said unto him, in response, what can I do? Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. Now, on the surface, this might seem like a really warm and fuzzy, I want to be next to Jesus moment, but it wasn't. Without any question, this is a very, very you know, selfish, interested request. I think, first off, they wanted to be recognized. We're going to sit on the right hand and the left hand. We want everybody to see us there. May I just tell you, leadership is not about recognition. Biblical leadership isn't. But I want, I want the attention, right and left. And uh, then, you know, this right and left hand recognition is followed with this, in thy glory. They wanted it to come at the crescendo of his ministry, as it were, when he's now the ruling, reigning one, and they wanted to be there, if you will. Not only did they want the recognition, but they wanted the royalty of this position that said, aha, we are right here with the number one person. Now, maybe that's a little exa exaggerated. I don't think so. But I can tell you this much. It was a very self-seeking aspiration on their part. May I just say this? Wanting to be a leader is not wrong. New Testament puts it this way. He that desireth the office of a bishop desireth a good thing. Wanting to be a leader is not wrong. 
I'm not trying to get everybody to go in some milk toast mode and say, well, you know, I'm not, I just don't want to be the leader. I'm going to be a martyr for Jesus. No, that's not what all is involved. It is appropriate to say, by God's grace, I want to do what God wants me to do. And if he wants me to carry out a task of responsibility, I want to do it with his help. But to have this motive that says, I want to have the attention. I want to be in charge. I want to be able to do No, that's not a biblical response in leadership as Jesus gives it to us. And so this setting for leadership, and by the way, as we move from that particular setting, every setting of leadership is not going to be the same, but I can tell you that frequently leadership settings are filled with carnality. Persons wanting to have attention, persons wanting to be recognized, persons wanting to be famous, persons wanting to be number one. Can I just tell you, the setting of leadership is a great lesson for us to observe here. But we move on to the second observation, and it's the stipulation for leadership in verses 38 through 40. The stipulation is given by Jesus. It's pretty simple. He says, But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. You know, at that moment, those guys should have really gotten their ears cleaned out and said, Whoa, we got into some place we weren't prepared to go. We're talking about something we're not qualified to talk about. We're requesting something that we're not eligible to request. We have no sense that that was their response. But Jesus puts it in context very clearly. He says, you don't know what you ask for. Can you drink the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I baptize with? Uh, if you will, we start with a sobering statement that Jesus has here in verse 38. He said, you guys don't even know what you're asking for. You're ignorant of what really is involved with properly serving as I would have you to serve, as I am seeking to serve. And so with that particular sense of request, he gives two real, you know, pretty concise statements. One, to be, uh, to be uh, as it were, uh, to drink the cup that I drink of, that first one, I think is a reference even to the future occasion when Jesus is asking for the cup to be removed from him in the garden. And that cup of drinking was going to be his death and separation from his father. And, and simply put, I, and Bible scholars are pretty concise with this, you know, Jesus is saying, you guys don't really realize if you're going to be that associated with me, you're going to die for me. And both of them did. Now, John died by way of natural death after torturous circumstances. James dies a martyr's death. But nonetheless, he says, you know, can you, you know, drink the cup that I give you? Here, here's the real facts. Leadership involves suffering, even to the point of dying for the cause of leadership. Not a pleasant thought, maybe, but a wonderful privilege to be like the master. And then he says, be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. And baptism in Scripture is regularly a, a mark of identica identification or, or relationship. Baptisms, you know, were done before Jesus instituted it as the, as the uh, particular part of the church ordinances that we observe, and rightly so. You know, baptisms were practiced in that day to show that a follower of a particular teacher was, you know, they were his disciple. And so Jesus is saying, look, are you, are you prepared to pay the price of being my disciple? And of course, then we get this very shallow statement in response, verse 39. After that sobering statement, verse 39 says, And they said unto him, We can. I mean, isn't it just appalling? You want to shake your head and say, Where in the world are you guys coming from? With such flippancy of response. We can. No big deal. And Jesus, again, graciously takes their, I think, uh, immaturity and their ignorance and, and their statement of impulsive arrogance. We can. By the way, a leader is somebody that must not be marked with arrogance, but with humility and with a sense of, as it were, controlled response, not impulsive response. One of the marks of a failing leader is a person who just acts impulsively rather than carefully and decisively. And so here we see this shallow statement followed then by this shocking statement and this stipulation for leadership. Verse 40, Jesus said, verse 39 and 40, pardon me, Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. The baptism that I am baptized shall be. Jesus gave them that much as it were responsive of affirmation. They were going to die for him, and they were going to be identified with him, far beyond what they even imagined at this point, but Jesus knowing. And so with that sense of a shocking statement, he said, Yeah, you know, you will die for me, you will declare me. 
But I want you to know, verse 40, to sit on my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give. It shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. I, I've, I've pondered that statement often and said, is it such that there's only going to be a couple of persons that in all the centuries of the church are eligible to sit next to Jesus? I, I don't have a, you know, a dogmatic answer here. I leave the Scripture to where it is, and when I find something I can't explain humanly, I think it's best to leave it alone. I'm going to leave that in Jesus' hands. But I do take this you know, reminder it is possible for us as God's children to seek to honor Him in such a way that we are with that assembly of those who are recognized as we stand before the Lord and with Him in glory. And even as it's been added with italics in our Scripture, I think it's not a singularity of identity. It's an opportunity for multiples, for them and so at this juncture, I don't want to go beyond that and trying to explain that phrase, but I do know this much. Jesus said very clearly on that occasion, the Father is going to determine who's going to have that status of identity with me. And so this stipulation is given to us. Only the Father would see it for whom it is prepared. But I want to move to the third observation as we move along, and that is the strife that comes with leadership. The strife, verse 41 I don't mean to suggest there's always strife when leaders are, are chosen or involved, but it's often the case. We sometimes put it in a realm that's somewhat maybe just uh, polite. We have a vote, and so a leader selected on the basis of a vote, and so there's some measure of turmoil that could be with that particular process. It's such that maybe a credentialing process will say, well, this person's eligible and this person's eligible, so you choose this person and this person says, that's not fair and, you know, I have this and that. You know, so strife is very much a part of typical leadership situations. Would you just note here in verse 41, and when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. It doesn't take any imagination to see this picture. They're all gathered. There's the 12 with Jesus, James and John, and their mother, according to Matthew's record, make this you know, request of Jesus to do for them what they wanted. And I'm sure it was probably sort of an informal conversation of sorts, but as it became a little more aware, and maybe the overhearing of the conversation and Jesus' responses caused the 10 to you know, sort of you know, lift up their ears and pay closer attention and and they find themselves just really, really, in fact, as Matthew says it even more strongly, they just got flat out mad. They didn't like it. And I have these two thoughts about what comes with this strife and leadership frequently, and that is the strife of envy. You know, they were just flat out jealous. When they heard it, they said, you know, I've heard one speaker say on this passage that they were just mad because they didn't think of it first. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case, but I do know this much. They were, they were greatly displeased. They didn't like what happened. And so the envy for positioning. And by the way, a true leader is also someone who is a good follower. I have said many times that you cannot learn to lead till you learn to follow. And so the best way to learn to be a leader is to be a follower. And they'd have done well to have listened to you know, Jesus' response and Say, okay, you know, at least we didn't get embarrassed with this little, you know, conversation. I wasn't so foolish as to ask that by, you know. I mean, there's any number of responses they could have had that would have appropriately learned from the occasion. But they find themselves envious. And so in that envy, we find this second thought as well. I call it the strife of, of exclusion. The strife of exclusion. That's a little awkward, but, you know, I needed a knee, and I like it. And hopefully you'll figure it out with me. You see, what was happening here is they find themselves now particularly identifying James and John as the guys that are out. We don't like these guys now. They're really sort of offended us. And may I just say that tragically in the strife of leadership, when leaders are involved, then there are persons who find themselves just sort of discounting and dismissing and excluding and, you know, don't want to have anything to do with. You know, the truth is biblical leadership is not going to do that. And so the strife that went with this leadership, strife of envy, strife of exclusion, they were displeased with James and John. And one, as it were, sort of put them on the, 
on the bad list. We're going to excommunicate them for a little bit. They're going to have to go last in line for lunch today. I don't know what it was, but I do know this much. They found themselves with great distaste for them at that point. But all that and all this brings us to this wonderful fourth observation. Up to this point, it's been pretty controversial and pretty, you know, maybe challenging. And you might say, boy, you know, if this is what's involved, I don't know if I even want to be a leader. I'd like you to just note then this fourth observation. I call it the syllabus for leadership. The syllabus. I don't know that it's technically a syllabus, but it's a great way to describe just the identity of what's involved with this. And so in verses 42 through 45, we find uh, Jesus says this. He called them to him. It's like he's trying to calm them down, say, now guys, come here, come here. I'm going to tell you something. He calls them to him and saith unto them, ye know that they who are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. I want to stop there because that becomes the first of our thoughts here with this uh, concept. And by the way, I just put here as an initial note, this is the only occasion, I said it earlier, but this is the only occasion where Jesus gives explicitly a philosophy of leadership in all of his earthly ministry. He, he exemplifies it lots and lots of ways without talking about leadership per se, but can I just tell you this is the only occasion. And so we ought to listen very carefully to his one lecture on leadership. And we start with, first of all, what I call the popular view of leadership in verse 42. The popular view. Look at verse 42. It's, it's filled with descriptions of what people think of when they think of a leader. In fact, I say this without accusation. I'm sure in this room, if we'd have started this and just given you a random chance, what is a leader? I have little question that some of these qualities or characteristics in this verse would have been included in your reference. Because it's such a popular perception, not just in the secular realm, but even in the ministry realm. Christians falsely identifying these particular features as the basis for what is a leader biblically. Would you note this popular view? It starts off, first of all, it says in verse 42, ye know that they who are accounted, as, accounted to rule over the Gentiles. If you will, number one characteristic of the popular view is position. Position. I have this position. I am a ruler. If you will, uh, I'll put it this way. If you want to just put it in some slang term, I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Can I just tell you, a true leader rarely, if ever, has to take that as their exercise of why they do something by way of decision or leadership responsibility. I'm in charge here, and so I'm making this decision. With that particular thought, this particular wrong view, Jesus is describing now the popular view. It starts with position. I rule. I'm the boss. But it moves on in verse 42. It says, they rule over the Gentiles. They exercise lordship over them. Pause that word lordship. Uh, this is a, a, a word that I say is power. You know, I, I have this power as a leader. And I will say without any denial that a leader who is even a biblically you know, model leader is going to have certain power responsibilities that go with it, but they're not going to find themselves flaunting that or abusing that. And so the power that's seen here in the word lordship, I say it this way in terms of just sort of the slang way, I'm over you. I'm over you. Not in the sense of done with you, but I'm on, as it were, the organizational chart above you. I'm over you. Jesus goes on to describe this popular view and says not only do they have this sense of position and power, but it's also prestige. Look at verse 42. They're great ones. They're great ones. Wow. Described with this, you know, very, you know, glamorous, you know, title of sorts. Uh, great ones, if you will. I'm important. I'm important. Make way for me. I do believe that it's important for us to recognize that God's leaders are such that they are important to the task of God's work, but they're never going to find themselves flaunting that if they're biblical leaders. And so this sense of prestige. But then the verse ends with this, great ones that exercise authority upon them. 
if you will, I use the last word, privilege. Privilege. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I've got the keys. I've got the office. I've got the, you know, parking spot. I've got the particular, you know, recognition that goes with it. Now, can I just say very honestly, tragically, in the realm of ministry, we have lots of folk who consider leadership with those concepts or some of those concepts, a position, some form of power, some form of prestige, some form of privilege that they have. I truly believe that Jesus was very clear in saying this is the Gentile model of leadership, I call it, the world's view of leadership. This is not God's view of leadership. And remember, we're talking about the form of the servant Jesus leads. Exercising biblical leadership is not based upon these four words. And so I say without any shame, it's a challenge to find our hearts eliminating those features from our understanding of leadership. I am so happy it doesn't end there. Jesus goes on and he says this, verse 43, but so shall it not be among you. This phrase in the text of Scripture is with the strength that's equivalent to when Paul in his writing says, God forbid. It's a, it's a contrast that is not even within distance of overlapping. So what's Jesus saying? If you're going to be a biblical leader, you're not going to be one that's like this. But that conjunction of, of, of opposite in the Bible... This, but this. And so with a sense of direct opposite, a contrast that's not even intersecting at any point, Jesus says, but it shall not be among you. And he goes on then to give what I call the proper view of leadership. The proper view of leadership. It starts with a demanded difference. I've already alluded to that before putting the point on the screen for you. It's not a matter of an option. This isn't just Jesus' view. This isn't just an alternative. This isn't just a nice idea. This is a mandated difference. This is a mandated difference. And so with that demanded difference, we see not so among you, God forbid, but in contrast, we see the delineation of the description that God wants to use in Jesus' teaching here. The delineated description is this, whosoever would be great among you, let him be your minister. You may have it in your text. It literally means let him be your servant. The word should be their servant rather than minister. Uh, we'll see in contrast to the use of that in the next verse. It's the word diakonos, from which we get our word deacon. He that would be great among you shall be your diakonos, your servant. If you will, it's a description of someone who has a, a measure of assistance that is constantly there, Without any recognition or titling or identity, they simply are exercising that graciousness. And so modes of leadership we see, first of all, to be a servant, verse 43. But then we go on to verse 44, and whosoever you would be chiefest shall be literally doulos, slave of all. It's from this particular rendition, honestly, that I don't mind saying that at the time that I was asked to write this book on servant leadership, I found myself taking their suggested title, a book on servant leadership, and as we moved along in my own preparation and the writings, I had to contact the publisher and say, I really feel like we should change the name of this to be slave leadership instead of servant leadership. They were gracious to hear me, but were cautious because that concept is a little bit maybe controversial in the marketplace, and so they sell books. So they said, well, give us a few weeks to just do some market sampling as to whether that change is going to be okay. And so for several weeks, they did some market research, came back and graciously said, we're willing to give it a shot. And so the title, Biblical Slave Leadership, was something that was in contrast to what was initially Biblical Servant Leadership. And it's out of this. He that would be chiefest, he that would be the leader, he that would be the leader in the ultimate sense, the prominent one, the chief, let him be your slave. Now, you might say, well, that's pretty hard to take because truthfully, you know, slaves are the lowest level on a, you know, uh, just sort of a cultural scale. May I just say the New Testament slave has some dramatic differences in what our popular conception of slavery is. I'll just say it this way. 
in the New Testament, the greatest uh, characteristic of a slave was not the loss of their ownership. That was true. Or the, you know, the task of serving someone else. The real identity of a, a biblical New Testament slave in Roman times was their identity with their master. That's what was a mark that was distinctive to New Testament slavery. And can I tell you, the greatest mark of identity that we get as we are leaders for the Lord is we get to be slaves of Jesus Christ. The highest accolade you could ever have is to be a slave of Jesus. And a leader that is ultimately a biblical leader is going to be obsessed with the ownership of Christ upon their lives to the extent that they are absolutely honored to say, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. That contradicts everything in our human being. We're creatures of pride and self-interest. But truthfully, Jesus says, He that would be chief, let him be your slave. That gives us not only the modes of leadership here, servant and slave, but also the model of leadership in verse 45. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to serve, to give His life a ransom for many. And so our Lord powerfully portrays that it's serving, it's sacrifice, and it is truly status. He was the Son of God, His heavenly Father, whom He served without exception. I hope that these thoughts will be both challenging and encouraging to you in the task of being a leader. I just summarize it with this very brief definition, which I encourage you to just capture because I think it puts it all together. So what is a biblical slave leader? A biblical slave leader is a stewardship from and to God. God gives us this privilege and assignment. It's from, and I give it back to Him as I serve. It's a stewardship from and to God, requiring the total surrender of myself to God. I'm a slave, total surrender to God with this one ambition to develop others in the will of God. It's not about me, the leader. It's not about any leader. It's about the people that you are able to develop in God's will that marks a leader biblically. And so when Jesus even left His earthly ministry, as I found myself so encouraged in my review and research these days, to find Him saying that His greatest joy was the fact that He had given Himself to His his twelve, all but one, And they will continue. And he even says to them, greater works than I've done, you will do. That's the mark of a leader, developing others in the will of God. And so I ask you in closing, will you be a biblical slave leader like Jesus? Will you be a biblical slave leader like Jesus? That means you're going to be willing to serve, willing to sacrifice. Recognizing your greatest status symbol is not your title nor your you know, car or anything that you may have, but your greatest title is, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ with this assignment that He's given me, a stewardship. And I have it from Him with this responsibility to give it back to Him and evidenced in the way that I develop others in God's will. The form of the servant, Jesus leads. Would you stand with me, please, as we seek to ponder these truths. My heart's cry this morning was to try and encourage you to aspire to the greatest opportunity that you can as a slave of Jesus. This title of slave to Jesus is such a precious privilege. It isn't demeaning. It isn't insulting. It isn't even confining is ultimately an opportunity to live the most rewarding and productive life ever imagined and beyond. Would you pour yourself into the renewal of being a slave of Jesus Christ? Oh, Father, take these truths that you have given so clearly in your word and would you eliminate from our thinking this world's view of what a leader is. Lord, I have to believe in this room there are some whose thoughts of that, whose even aspirations for that have been measured by those things that you said, no, not not among you. Protect us from that, Lord, so that we can truly fulfill the assignment that you've given, the stewardship that you've given to us. 
raise up in this audience of students and staff members biblical slave leaders to the glory of God. For Jesus' sake I pray, amen.